it's not a case of it being a sugar-coated pill. It's just that they present it in a way that even though you may be very surprised and you may be taken aback and you may be shocked and you may be even disturbed by some of the things you find in their books, it is still accessible and it remains a good read, firstly. Right, though. So I'm going to ask them a few questions. At the end of the, our talk, you are welcome to ask them some questions because I'm sure you are going to have some. Let's get going. What, for you, was the balance between painful and therapeutic when you... Wait, I'm going to interrupt myself. I'm going to ask both of them to firstly just tell us, not, you know, not a summation. You don't have to give it, you know, the whole book in a few words, but what is Lansdowne Dearest about? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if you don't know by now, I don't know how you got around to writing it. I, I last read it in 2020. <laughs> no, um, it is about forced removals um, in a specific period. It's from the 1960s to 1980s. Um, it's not District 6, it is um, the southern suburbs that I'm looking at, uh, specifically Lansdowne, which is now Rondebosch East. Um, and your family? Um, not necessarily so. Um, it's a small social commentary as well, um, because you can just go so far with your family. Yeah, there are only so many. <laughs> Right. There are only so many of them, and also you are covering a part of history, so yes, it is. Yeah, it needs yeah. to be. It actually needs to be yeah. wider than just four yeah. or five or six. See, people. what happened was when I went to um, Somerset East to the um, Jack Gable Foundation um, uh, mentorship program with NB, um, I was I had written quite a long, <laughs> very very weird um, first. Um, draft and Tia Naima sent me yeah. to Somerset East to learn how to um, structure and write properly and so um, write a book properly. Yeah. And so when I got there, I had three parts in my first draft, and um, Suzette looked at everything and then she said, This is your strongest story. And so that is how come I ended up just writing. Um, from 1966 to 1980. So I write in a voice. The, the voice changes. Yeah, and it even progresses, though, really even changes. though it's only one third, it's still a sizable book. Yeah. You know, so I had to expand. I had to expand. Okay, right, yeah. right, right. right. Um, so that's um, that's why I brought in social commentary. So this just basically said. Um, I write everything that you remember from that period. And I also had to restrain my own voice, my adult voice. Right. Um, so I'm writing as a child, as a teenager. Um, I'm writing from, I think, four or five until 18. And I write in that voice. Right. Your yeah. voice of back then, yes. Yes, so my voice of back a, then. you had a manuscript when you went there to somebody that said, East yeah. of the Jakes Herba Foundation, we lived in stayed in Paulette House, you had a finished manuscript, even yes. though only part of it was yeah. used later on, whereas Shana, you had basically nothing <laughs> <laughs> yet. Yeah. yeah, that's one of the things, things I know I know about Shana is that she's never satisfied with what she's written. She is going to rewrite it later on at that stage. Now, anyway, Ochat has appeared, so tell us what it's about. Okay, so... Ochat is my journey as a young colored child into adulthood and how my community on the Cape Flats specifically influenced the bad and good decisions that I made growing up. Um, it does speak a lot about sexuality and gender-based violence, but I don't think it's only about that. It's sort of the, and I'm by no means saying that the colored girl experience is just that, but it's sort of my interpretation of the colored girl experience from my perspective and the perspective of the people that grew up around me. And that's it. Much like Bronwyn um, said she also did, I had to write it in a voice that was one of the Shainas from, you know, yeah. in my head, but it's not Shaina now. It's very much from the perspective of the child learning yes. the things around her and then becoming me now. Okay, so it's looking back, but putting yourself in the shoes of the child of back then. Yes. 
Which brings me to the next question. What for you, I'm going to ask you first and you first to answer the same question. What for you was the balance between being between painful and therapeutic when you had to relive certain experiences in order to write about them? It was physically painful. When I came back from Somerset East, I had just 22,000 words, one um, section, and Suzette had written comments on the side um, to this, take this out. And so I sat there for about a week, sat staring at the wall, <laughs> doing all sorts of things. And then when I began to um, take this thing apart, and I, I knew, uh, I thought, okay, let me put, create chapter titles. So I made chapter titles, I wrote it on pages, and I cut it up, and then <laughs> I took those 22,000 22, words, and I cut it up, and put everything in the categories that it had to, uh, and then um, I entered it in on the netbook. Okay. And then from there, I would think, okay, this is what happened at school, this is what happened at high school, this is what I remember. I had to write about um, things that I used in my first drafts. I created all sorts of funny names. <laughs> um, and Naima actually asked me, why are you doing this? And I said, I don't want to name people. Oh, okay, and right, so, right. So you were talking so, about existing people, but you were giving them yeah, other names. Yeah, so I made up funny names. And then um, what I did eventually, what changed for me um, was... That same week when I was busy staring at the wall, I went to Kenora Centre. And there I saw my auntie's um, sister-in-law who had looked after her. And in, my auntie had left the house to the sister-in-law um, in lieu of looking after her. And there was some stuff that was left. And I asked her before I could ask about the photos because my, my auntie's husband took thousands of photos including excellent pics of when um, District 6 was being destroyed. So that was supposed to go to the District 6 Museum. It didn't end up there. It ended up in Bin. Um, okay, I'm giving away a part okay. of the book. Okay, okay. But anyway, yeah. meeting this woman changed everything for me. Because what she told me was so devastating. It's actually the very last part of the book. And I went home and I thought, no, hell. I'm going to actually name names. I'm going to give those people dignity. Because yeah. when we were in Somerset East, um, so they could see that I was a bit afraid of, of actually writing. Um, and Naima also knew about my fear of writing about my family and all that. And so um, with the result, after that experience of meeting this lady, um, I thought, no, I've got to do this. I've got to, um, and then it was easy for me. Um, after that, it took me about 14 days. But the writing process, that 14 days, it was like a clamp on my head. It was like something pressing, pressing all the time until I was done. With it. Well, maybe it's not a bad thing that there was a clamp on your head because it, you know, forced yeah, your head open. Yeah. I just want to say that when when you when she is referring to Suzette, it's Suzette Kutsia Meiber who works for the Jacques Schreiber Foundation as a mentor. She was Bronwyn's mentor, and because I was, you didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't want the political. I was very <laughs> scared of more a case of you know autobiography. Autobiogra autobiographical no, it stuff. Was politics, and, I you said. <laughs> and I was Shana's mentor, although always the name or the word mentor sounds very professional and very, you know, dignified and so on, whereas we were kind of having fun. Yeah. Plotting and scheming and, and, and going on and so on. <laughs> and killing off people and deciding who's going to get away with murder, basically. Yeah. Okay. What what but, was for you? Can I ask you yeah. something? When you were yeah. working with Shana, oh, did you actually think that um, this could be a non-fiction? 
<laughs> because Ohot was not what we were working on originally. That, that book is still going to come out right. It's going to be called Hope Triggered so. Unless You've Changed Your Mind. So we were, work, we were, working, we're actually working on a story. Yeah. So Ohot came, in, came out in the meantime. It's, and then that's going to be the answer to one of the questions I'm going to ask both of you. Okay. But that's what you were going on. Okay, let's get to this again with the balance between painful and therapeutic when you were working on some very personal stuff. Okay, so Ohat is obviously my life story, right? It's, it's personal. It's everything that I've experienced as like a human being. I did not see a difference while writing. I might be wrong, I don't know psychology, but for me, painful and therapeutic was the same thing. Because of the amount of pushing down everything that I, I felt while I was experiencing and living through those, those events. Because a lot of the time, when going through something difficult, you ignore it on a level. Mm -hmm. You know, you're doing the things, you're there, but if you let it encompass you and you sort of look at it in its entirety, it's going to destroy you so you're not going to get through it. Mm -hmm. So when I sat down, for the first time in, I was around, I was 29 when I, 20, 30, I just turned 30 when I, when I wrote Ohat. When I sat down and I wrote it, I felt everything. But that also meant that it was exiting my body. Mm -hmm. So I cried, I, I, I stared at the wall a lot. <laughs> I phoned Bronwyn saying, I suck at this, I don't wanna do this anymore, Bronwyn. You know, mm -hmm. like she was, she was really my anchor during the process. Read this quickly, is this terrible, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it also made me physically ill. So there was there was this point between, because you do your first draft and then you send it away to be butchered and insulted, <laughs> right? And then as I sent it to Amy, because I published with her, Jonathan Ball, I'm um, to Jonathan Ball. As I sent it to her, I felt physically that the right side of my body was lamb. Like lame lamb, lamb, <laughs> it was lamb. Um, and so, I was like, no, man, it's fine. Maybe it's because I wrote like 100,000 words or something. It's physical, strain, mm. strain. And then a day or two went by, and I said to my husband, even my face is lump, my neck, I can't do it. Am I having a stroke? And he said, go to the doctor. And I went to the doctor, and she, she examines me, and by the point that I'm there, I can't move the side of my body anymore. Wow. And she examines me, she gives me the Voltaren injection, and she's like, there's nothing physically wrong with you right now. And then when I explained to her the process that I was going through, she's like, this is trauma. Yeah, because stuff you've suppressed mm. or that you thought you had dealt with, you are dealing with again and, you know, basically reliving it because it's all being dragged to the surface. Definitely. And she said to mm. me something I, I knew but didn't know, like nobody's ever said it to me. Your body holds on to your emotional stuff, different parts of your body. It's actually something Suzette said to me when my throat mm. got sore during one of our, our yes. trips. And she was like, hmm, tonsils. And she goes in a book and she's like, this means, you know, yeah. you have issues with whatever. She was right, by the way. Yeah. And the doctor says to me, you held on to all of that trauma in your face, in your neck, in your body. Mm. And this is the first time you're letting it go. And I will say, I noticed also after that experience of, and I've, I healed mm. and I rested, my body felt relaxed. My jaw wasn't as tight as it was mm -hmm. during that process. So the pain and the trauma was same thing and necessary. Mm -hmm. I mean, the pain and the, the um, therapy was necessary. D don't get me wrong. I still very much need um, actual therapy where I speak to someone about it because I'm unpacking a lot of things that come after, mm -hmm. like living on the opposite side of the trauma now. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was equal. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how do you structure something that's so personal? Because it's not like a story that you can plot. You are basically working on your own story or reliving part of your own story or even, you know, otherwise events from people that you've known that you are reliving. How do you, how do you structure? How do you decide what goes where? Okay, mine was a timeline that I had to use um, because I was hopping back and forth in my original draft. I would go yeah, there, everywhere. I was also incapable of um, speaking about emotions. Yeah. Okay. So because did you go, a as a memory came up, did you go yeah. there and, yeah. Uh, I'm a journalist, so you're trying to stand on the outside, look at facts, keep your emotions intact and whatnot. Um, but what happened with that? <laughs> I had to learn how to express emotion. When I went to Somerset East, Suzette said, you coming in here with a thick, heavy winter coat in summer, 
we have to take that and we have to strip you down completely. We never got to that point because I found a way around it. Um, the first part of the book is um, it's more, um, it's like a story. It's more fantasy. Um, uh, it's memory, but I, I start off like a, a like a fairy tale type of effect, and then I go until you get the darkness. From midway through, as I get older, and I'm beginning to realize, okay, there's something wrong about this society. So and as a whatnot. small child, you didn't notice everything that yeah. was going on. I noticed the personal yeah. stuff. I would always be around the adults. I would hear all the scunner. I would hear who's um, which teenagers pregnant and all that type of thing. I knew all that, um, but uh, and and uh, they scared me. Because this drama that everybody was loving through was like huge, huge, yeah. huge, huge drama. Um, and, and of course, I knew also about people being removed and, you know, all that. You hear it in the background and whatnot. I spent a lot of time outdoors avoiding adults. Um, so <laughs> so uh, what happened eventually with the writing of the book, I had to remember all that and then I also had to fault out a lot of bad things that I had heard which would still offend loving people you know okay. so I didn't I left that out okay yeah okay. but it was easy it was relatively easy with our first um, trip to some of these I was able then to structure learn about timelines because it, it was very rigid about it she said this, 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 this. And then I came up with the titles. And when, once I came up with chapter titles, it was a bit easier. And yeah. because of this lady who, who um, did this thing, um, I'm not going to say, in case you haven't read the book, um, that thing became part of my book as well. It was became another character. Um, the, the house is a character, my grandpa's, my great grandpa's garden is a character, and this third thing. And this yeah. third thing can talk. Um, <laughs> and so I was able to drop all the way through, I would drop this thing into the book mm -hmm. until the very end you realize things not there anymore. Okay. So it is it is that that thing which came with my grandpa. My great grandpa from Rondebosch to the south. So this this thing was there all the time in their lives until the yeah. very end. It was the last thing that to go. Yeah. And Shana, yes. Where do you just where do you decide, for example, when you're writing your story, where to start and where to stop? I think it was easy. For me, because I knew I was going to talk about from the moment I was born until no. young adulthood. Mm -hmm. right. um, but where I, where I think I made a couple of mistakes, actually, and Oh, is published now. Um, yeah. The, I mean, we all make them, and yeah. then it's published. <laughs> I should have stopped, and I didn't think about it while I was writing it. I should have stopped and perhaps self-assessed when I wrote about other people's trauma around me. I have this thing, I don't know if other people do it, where everything that happens is about me, <laughs> you know, like whether it's in your family, how does this affect me? I'm angry, how do I feel about it? Mm. And then, um, so after the first run, um, they reprinted and then it is where my, before the reprint, one of my aunties, Auntie Brenda from the, I had to think what name did I give her? Auntie Brenda contacts me and she's like, you know, Shaina, I know you were there. I know you saw the things that happened to me. But at some point you could have asked me if I was okay with rereading it in um, a book. And I was wrong, I apologized. Um, I said to her, what, you know, what do I do in this instance? She's like, we support you, um, but I don't know, what, what do you do? So I put the disclaimer in the second run, in the beginning, where I say, um, these stories are mine. She said to me, she wants people to just know it's my perspective. And she was right, it's my perspective, <clears throat> sorry. And we all experience the same, the same thing differently. And this is my perspective as a child and how I remember it. And I'm happy to, have interpretations from the other people that were there, you know? Mm -hmm. And that was where I should have stopped. In certain in certain parts of the book, there were incidents and where people did things to me, but there were also times where people did things around me that weren't for me to share. 
um, and that's perhaps, very difficult though because I mean you are is. telling your story but you are connected to other people and exactly. so yeah. so as much as I, I I obviously before I wrote the autobiography I got the legal breakdown of what I can and can't say and I very strictly followed those rules but names were changed I didn't have, nobody's identifiable but um I think I should have made contact with some of the people where it wasn't done to me, it was done around me. I think that was important. I know better now. Um, I'm, mm. I'm thinking of the Johnny Depp Amber Heard defamation case at the moment. Mm. I mean, if, she, if she'd asked him whether it was okay for her <laughs> no, to I place that, that article <laughs> about domestic abuse, then I get that. there wouldn't be this <laughs> court case going on now. No, fully. Well, anyway. It's just, it's just one of those personal things that I learned to acknowledge other people's trauma as as important as mine in the narrative. Mm -hmm. Because being selfish is sort of a human thing. Mm -hmm. I only I only know my stuff and my perspective. Yeah, but you are, you are going to see any story from your perspective 100%. anyway. And you know, it's a first person narration, mm -hmm. so yes. Do you feel any differently about your book now that it's published than you did when it was accepted, for example? I think I've always been dissociated mm -hmm. from the book. Um, Why do you feel, you know, you want um, to create this? I things? think I, <laughs> only after I wrote it, I've mm. always had a big hole in my soul. <laughs> and I went to therapy, I think it was 1984 for the first time. My therapist was the psychiatrist, Afrikaans poet, and um, chamber musician, Paul Duplessis. And <laughs> Phil protected me because, um, in a way, because he knew of my love for the arts and writing and all that. So that is what he built up. And he would never, he actually didn't, I, I mentioned um, Phil, I went through forced removals. Phil didn't understand. So we always skirted around that big no, black also, this hole. was 1984 yeah. when yeah it's it was almost like i mean people were aware of this but yeah. it wasn't as widely discussed yeah as yeah now, okay. so we didn't ever talk about it and while i was writing i realized ah oh, that's why therapy took so long 16 yes. years so you were still being your, <laughs> so you were being your own therapist yeah, yeah. again and yeah mm. yeah I mean, even a Catholic priest told me once, you have a big hole in your soul. <laughs> yeah, like, but it's, what are you talking yeah, about? <laughs> and also, it's easy to tell someone you've got a hole in your soul, but now how do you go yeah, about filling it? Yeah, yeah. Mm. So this was very therapeutic for me. Um, but I, I don't look at the book. I don't read my words. It, sits, it lives in a backpack. Uh, yeah. The first... Um, the first six copies i actually gave to neighbors i gave to my cousin joe and then i had nothing and then um one of the neighbors said the whole all the people in her block and her friends and all the red so she gave it back to me okay now <laughs> at least so i have a copy one. yeah i have a copy <laughs> right. yeah i'll feel guilty about keeping this one when i leave I'm not <laughs> giving it to you yeah shayna yes when you yeah as I said, I know you've never finished with something, but do you feel differently about the book now that it's published, now that it's out there, from when you had just finished it? Differently how? Like, um, How much would you want to change if you had to change something, if, if you had the opportunity of changing it now? Besides what I said previously, yes. I don't think I'd change anything because it okay. is my true 100% yeah. laying it down. Um, I'd add a few more things just for yeah. context. Yeah. I, I didn't really read Ohat again after I lit it up. Mm. You know, I didn't want yeah, to. Yeah, because then you just see all the mistakes, and all I the did. things you would want to change. <laughs> yeah. I only read it, I want to say, two months ago. I had mm. to do it for a, a mm. sort of project and I, I read it again. And maybe it's a good thing that you don't have the opportunity of adding those things because, mm. you know, it's been written and sometimes the book or the story is strong enough that you don't need to add a lot of things. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I'll, you see, yeah. the thing is, I never liked my work, like you said earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I look back at it critically and I think, mm, that needed to be connected a little bit more or whatever. But it, I, I'm happy with I'm happy with what I put out there and I'm happy with what it's done, you yeah. know. So, I know, I don't think I'll change it, actually. Yeah. Unlike with a novel, there is no distance between your writing and you yourselves. Mm -hmm. 
So did that make you feel exposed, putting it out there and saying, this is my story, or at least this is my story and other people around me? Not at that stage of my life. Yeah. I'd come to the end of the road, I think, of like going over the same old story in my head. Um, I think it was from 2018 when I first began my first draft. Then the dissociation, the letting go yeah. um, began. Suzette said, and I also, it became a mission for me. When Suzette, Suzette told me, she, I think she must have, it must have been some kind of psychological trick or something. When she told me, uh, write for your community. And I thought, this is every person's, uh, every family story. So I focused not just on the hardships, but the actual life that was going on around. You know, people doing the best that they could. So, so there was performance, there was a lot of performance, a lot of music, um, a um, lot of shows, and a lot of people just getting out there and like hiking and doing positive things. Yeah, and because, so, yeah. yeah I yeah. think with forced removals, when people think about it, they, you know, it was mm. such a shocking, disturbing yeah. thing. But the people obviously they went were, on living. They went on living, yeah. they had to find ways, you know, to yeah. make life bearable and to make life fun. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, um, Trevor Jones. The composer, mm -hmm. he came from District 6. Yeah. Lots of people. So you know, they do made it. You can, um, yeah, yeah, you can say what he kept himself busy yeah, with. Yeah, music, yes. composition. Yes. Um, lots of. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of, uh, lots of doctors, lots of architects, people who just went on living. They knew this um, harsh reality of what was happening around, but they also realized, okay, we have to go on living. And and this is that that harsh reality gave them impetus to 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 achieve. Yeah. Yeah. And Shaina, you because with you it's a, a very very personal story, you know, bare bones and direct. Mm -hmm. Did you feel exposed when it came out? Not initially. But after being approached by a couple of people here and there, you know, and sort of realizing there's this moment of, wow, I put everything out there, especially when people were angry afterwards. It's like I, I put my, my everything from virginity to sexual assault to sex on purpose to like, you know, I, I talk about a lot of things that a lot of people don't share about themselves. I had that moment and I didn't expect to have that moment. So that was also something I, I learned about myself that I do actually have a level of scam. To, I didn't in the beginning <laughs> because a lot of people who, who bought Ohat knew me from my blog about my body and myself and the things that I, that I address in the book. It's just that when you now have this tangible thing that is out there on the shelf, and people can walk in and, and it's not like I'm going to send you the link and maybe check this out, Ho, you know. It's yeah. like it's there. And in the in the blurb, it it's says she talks voice. about discovering her sexuality in her daddy's house. And you're just like, okay, it's, <laughs> it's a lot, right? And then I, I started to get shy. I had a couple of weeks where I didn't want to talk about it anymore. Or, or leave the house. <laughs> or leave the house. And, and when my children yeah. found it, when, when my son, because I yeah. have an almost teenager. When he was like, oh, mommy, can I see? And I was like... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You know, because I don't want to be a hypocrite because I do believe that I wrote for the young girl and the young boy. Yeah. Because what's the point of, of reading it after when you yeah. when you can navigate around with information, right? And then he got to a point where it got weird and he was like, mm, no, thank you. <laughs> so he stopped himself and I felt exposed in that moment. But now I think I've made another, I've made another sort of leap in my development. And now I'm just like, it is a part of past China. I'm very mm. much removed from it, even though it is my autobiography. Yeah, yeah because you poured it into yeah. a shape. And, and now it's and, gone. And, and now mm. it's a finished product. It's a book that you can touch. I mean, mm. even if it's yeah. still, you yeah. know. Can I say something mm. about that? I, I don't associate Ochat with Shana at all. The Shana <laughs> I know. I don't, um, like for me, Ochat is a book. Ochat is something completely separate from the Shana mm. I work for. 
And you know, mm-hmm. Suzette was very, very, very mm-hmm. right. I have had to think about my next 14 years. We actually structured that in some East. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it was a huge part of history that mm-hmm. everybody, um, everybody writes about these days. I, I was a journalist during the apartheid era. I worked in the townships. I was there for Mr. Mandela's release. I did a lot of things, like super important stories. But for me, it's flimsy compared to that big black hole that I've just filled. And I'm finding it very difficult to actually access that part of my memory. Because I was there, um, I was in that position without having the structure of that. Yeah. So I was um, basically um, going from story to story and story and story, whatever. Seeing um, houses being burnt, seeing houses being bulldozed, um, you know, when the the squatters would move into um, um, land that belonged to the state or whatever, seeing those people without homes and things, and I would just be standing there on the side, taking notes, um, going back, writing my story, and was also very much pushing down emotions. Yeah, because, I mean, if you're overwhelmed by emotions, you're not supposed to be when you are a journalist. You're supposed to make a story out of it. Yeah and keep yourself out of it. But on the other hand, you must have been, yes, suppressing some. Yeah, mm. a lot of it was unconscious, um, a lot of it was unconscious content, so. Yeah, yet to be revealed. Yeah, (laughs) I don't know if I'll ever be able to do it. I've Mm. tried various patterns. I've tried it as, um, I've even gone as far as, um, Obviously, I've gone into the fiction idea of it, um, but I haven't been able to get to grips with it. I would get mm. maybe two, three or four or five chapters and then delete. Okay. Maybe you shouldn't delete. Maybe you should keep it in a drawer and one day you'll discover it that it's not as bad <laughs> as you thought yeah. and something can be made of this. Yeah. Because, yeah. And China, um, in a novel, there are supposed to be very few, if any, loose ends. But, you know, the story isn't over because here you are still. So even if though you deal with the past, you, you know, we don't ever completely finish with it. Apart from yourself, are there any other loose ends to this story that you can think of? That's a difficult, that's a difficult one. That's my job. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> when you say loose ends... What exactly do you mean? Yeah, it's it's like if if you're writing a novel and there are some characters that suddenly, you know, in the last ten chapters don't appear again, that'll be a loose end. I or see. yes, or some threads or some topics that you've picked up but aren't properly mm. explored. Are there things that you would like to keep over for another book or maybe even use in a fictional story? Yeah. I don't know if if I'll ever write anything autobiographical and use something from mm-hmm. it, mm-hmm. but I do I do think a loose end would be exploring because um, I do speak about it in the final chapters. Mm-hmm. Currently navigating after trauma, I think like after after trauma, I think we speak a lot about surviving stuff mm-hmm. and the the extremes of some people are destroyed, like you know, and some people yeah. are or they, they go on to change the world and, and, you know, and then you get this middle where my life is just back to normal now. I have a job, I have kids, I have, I'm navigating normal world with the things that happen to me. And I think writing about being in a healthy space after all of that and how you are affected is something that if I were to write again about maybe where I, in 10 years time, maybe, okay, so what's Ochat Part 2? You know, mm. that's, 
crude, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> it would be that. It would be, this is what my normal looked like. And speak about more the relationship of being pregnant in a healthy space and being with a man that doesn't hit me or that treats me like a human being. Because a lot of women that I encounter who, who resonated with Ohat still don't know what, okay, so I know what I'm not looking for. What am I looking for? What is yeah. what what is the 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 goal the thing you know, so so I think that is the loose end that I would love to to explore. Yeah. So so not reacting to something that is happening to you, but deciding what you want to happen. Yeah. And and yeah. where it's gonna go. Mm. And even just now going back to normal, you were you were this like main character in this dramatic thing for such a long time, and now, or maybe you've been dreaming about something, or just living a life, or getting married, or which is not a prize. I just mean like a normal everyday societal thing. And now you're there, now what? How do I navigate? I don't want to always be talking about my trauma or it's not going to be the thing that, yeah. that is my life. Yeah. So how Shouldn't do I normal? You. Yeah. How do I mm. normal? How do I just be? And that is something that mm. I would I would definitely like to explore of how I did it mm. and see if that's helpful. Mm. Okay. Bronwyn, with reference to this book, what is the question you get asked most? Is there a question you get asked? Mm. Yes. Mm. A lot of people ask me how I remember. Mm. I just remember. Um, uh, everybody mm. told me stories. Okay. Um, so I don't know why I end up, ended up being told all these stories, um, especially the first part. They asked me, did you go to your aunties or did you go to this? I didn't approach my family at all. Um <laughs> well, you're easy to Obviously talk to. not. <laughs> but what mm. I did was I um, I remembered. And as I was going through, what I needed to put down on paper would suddenly just pop up. It was like a file being opened in my head. Yeah. And then it would come out and it would just fit into. I actually wrote that only in 14 days. Oh. <laughs> No, and it's, when it's I went like back to Somerset East, um, Suzette says, no, you don't have to write anymore. So <laughs> all I did was, I, I actually thought mm. I would be working on at least another two drafts. Because that's what she told me right at the start. Yeah, but un then, until you surprised her by... Well, yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. By, I think it was yeah. a moment of sure anger that drove me to finish mm. it. And, you know, okay, let's get this done now. Well, that's good. I think writing it in a, you know, in yeah. one big spurt is going to yeah. give it that driven quality. Yeah. And so all I did then after that was uh, work on footnotes. Um, get and the photos together. Yeah, and, get yeah, photos yeah. together. And then we did line by line. Um, uh, what's it? Line editing. Yes. Yeah. So we actually learned a lot more, <laughs> a lot more than what we mm. were expected to learn. Yeah, because I mean, having gone through, you know, you know yeah. through it line by line, which I think is a very good exercise, because those are mistakes you are not going to make. Yeah. Oh, many of them you are automatically not going to make when you're writing your next yeah, yeah, piece of yeah. whatever you are writing next. And, mm. and then also Francois, mm. um, <laughs> Suzette taught me Afrikaans technique that's used a lot mm -hmm. in um, uh, in Afrikaans literature, and I only found it out afterwards, uh, which is uh, the spanning line. Okay. <laughs> and so that is what I, that is what I probably will write for the rest of my life: spanning line and yeah. and dropping the clues in. Yeah, because the spanning yeah. line. I mean, it's, it's supposed to be there in every. Yeah every piece of writing people yeah. think it's only supposed to be in crime thrillers or so yeah. but it should be there in a romantic novel it should be there in an autobiographical piece of mm. work etc shana what do you ask most when people talk about the book i actually do get the how did you remember question quite oh. a bit okay um i thought about it and i believe and this might sound wishy-washy it's because in those instances, I didn't feel, I never left. And so it would, it's there because yeah. it's not resolved. Yeah. So I look back, could look back on my whole childhood and remember things that were painful to me that other people forgot because it wasn't important mm. to them, you know. And I've always been an observer. I'm a quiet person. I'm very introverted. If you, if you know me personally, I, I can talk mm. to my friends. Yeah. I, don't, I don't like engaging really. 
Um, not that I don't like it. I'm bad at not it. Not that she doesn't do it. <laughs> I disagree, but anyway. <laughs> Regardless. Um, so even as a child, I just, it's almost like I was recording things, like, because I like to think about things and I want to know why is that happening like that? Yeah. Why did you do that? That's weird. Actions that people take for granted, they, they stick with me. So when people ask me, how did you remember? It's because it was there. It was important. It was important to me. And that's why when I sat down, I could tell you everything. Yeah, you internalized a lot. And then yeah. when you started writing, it could pour out. Mm. What mm. I find funny is that now, um, after I wrote all of it and it's gone, I'm fuzzy on it now. Like, if you ask me what exactly is in Ogat, I know my story, I know me, I know what I do, but I have to be like, oh, yes, no, that part, yes, you know? It's almost mm. as if I, I'd let it go. I don't mm. need, I'm not in, I'm not in danger anymore, so I don't have to keep recording. Mm. Yeah. So, and that is a real thing, and that's why I think when we do autobiographies, because autobiographies are usually about trauma, mm. being forcibly removed as trauma, sexual assault, a lot of it, we don't just write autobiographies, this is what the day in the life of the normal, whatever is, right? Yeah. It's about something that, that, that happened. Mm -hmm. A lot of us remember because we had yeah. to live it. And, and also it must be... Be no, present. No, mm. I'm done. It must be so, uh, somewhat like seeing a psychiatrist, you know, being mm. deciding and then also being helped or forced to, you know, yes. and, and when you relive those things, you are supposed to relive them and then let go. Mm. So yes. maybe writing a book about those experiences can have the same effect. I've got one question for both of you still, and then we can let the yeah. room ask you. What are you working on now, even if it's only in your head? Bronwyn? Okay. I'm working, I think you yes. can take that, yes. I'm, I'm working uh, with a friend of mine. Uh, we are... Uh, she, she, uh, anyway, we're working on, um, we're plotting <laughs> some um, series, a series. It's a seri eco, yeah. Right, yeah. a series of books? A series of books. Okay, okay. So we are in the planning stages of the first one. Um, what so, kind of and book? my friend yeah. is um, Andrea Weiss. She was, um, we actually started yeah. uh, work on the same day at the Argus in 34 mm. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> right. So we are working on this. Um, we have, we've Is it been going to be fictional? Fictional, mm. yeah. And, and then, of course, um, on the back burner is always book two. Right. Yeah. But these are the series book of books that you are plotting. Is it going to be like... It's going to have a lot of eco stuff in, because my friend right. so is... So it's going, um, going to be serious drama orientated? It's, they're not going to be action thrillers? Mm. <laughs> How shall I say? It will be pretty, you know, the work of Philip Hook. Yeah. Something right. like that. Something inspired yeah, by... Yeah, yeah. Though not the same. Okay. But not, something like that, but not quite. Yeah. Right. Okay, Shayna, what are you working on? I deeply hate this question. Um, <laughs> you know that book you and I were working on yes, three years very ago? Well. <laughs> that one. <laughs> that right. I'm currently. So when I left um, the, the fellowship, obviously mm. it went into mm. the production, they read it, and then um, my Ohad came out, and then years passed, we had COVID. It was a, it was a shit show. And then mm. Stevlin. It still is. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's bad. And then Stevlin from Ireland um, got back to me, and she was like, we like your book, and I was like, mm -mm. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing because because when like we were, we were plotting the story that <laughs> Shana also changed a few times. I mean, I liked it, and, and yeah, I read out that book I'm, twice. As I'm a bit picky, yeah, uh, <laughs> but no. <laughs> Regardless, mm. I sort of look. We all grow. Every every book mm. you write or everything you do, you sort of a new person when you start a new project. So I was glad that that amount of time had passed when I yeah. got it back to edit. And when I, when I read it, it no longer resonated with me because the person who wrote it was dead. <laughs> it was done, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. And then, and then I, I sat with Sev, who was always so very understanding of me and my anxiety attacks. And I said to her, I want to write. I want to use what I've written here, but I want to write something better. So currently I am working. I don't want to give too much of it away, mostly because I'm still creating it in my mind. Yeah. But it is, I will always, I can't say, I will always write about the colored story and about avenues and offshoots of being a colored person, whatever that means to, to other people, but what it specifically means to me, Shayna Cape that's colored, that identifies as colored. And I, it is a supernatural element to it. 
I very much want to explore um, the link between trauma and paikhalufis and the thing that we the things and we sort spooker, of yeah. and spooker yeah. Yeah. Um, and how those that those things our parents installed in us that might seem sort of don't have a place in modern society how it shaped us and that is currently what I am plotting out now. Right. That should keep you busy a while. Very long, yes. Good. We can take some questions. Who wants to ask Ms. Lay some questions? <laughs> yes. I'm going to ask my question in Afrikaans to the two ladies because they are from Cape Town. Can I come on? Yes. I said to you, two ladies, then I will let me like that in the sack. But you are all to be a deep, deep racket. Wat jylle beinvloed het om te skryf dit wat jylle skryf. Wat zou dit wees? Ek, ek, ek het die idee, maar ek wil van jylle hoor. Wat het jylle beinvloed, wat het jylle gemaakt? Wat het vir die oorzaak dat jylle skryf dit wat jylle skryf in die, in die twee boeken van jylle? Do you understand my question? Yes. Okay. Are you asking me, so I'm, I'm not first language Afrikaans, but I'm trying. Jy, jy kan jy die tweede taal ook maar gebruik. Are you asking me, what was the main motivation behind why, why I wrote what I wrote? Um, yeah. The bigger thing, the thing bigger than me. Yes. I don't ever want other women to have to experience what I experienced and think that it is an isolated event. I think growing up, we, we grew, I grew up in a lot of shame, not necessarily on purpose from the people around me, but there is shame very much embedded into, into the culture I grew up into. I don't necessarily mean colored culture, just the culture of the time. And... As I grew older, I had a lot of lonely moments. Moments where I didn't like myself and I, and I felt wor worthless and unworthy and a lot of those, those negative sort of buzzwords. And I also, when, 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 I, when I opened my eyes and I looked at other women older than me, you can sort of see that pain in them, that fighter spirit slash I am, I am in pain, there's nobody. I can't tell you about this intricate thing. I can't tell you about my husband. I can't tell you about the sexual assault. I can't because you're going to blame me. And that's a lot. There's like a whole spider web of things. But the main motivator in that and noticing that was that <laughs> I'm already seen as these slechter things. That's all right. I don't want other people to feel anything like that. And so I wanted to be like that fall guy, you know, that person. And that was my motivation, the bigger than me. Bronwyn? I actually wanted to set um, everything free. Back that time, I wanted to say, family, go. Um, community, go on. Advance. Don't stay back there. So that is why I actually eventually thought, okay, I can do this, um, and I did. I wanted to set people free. Okay, okay. another question. I had said, I had my head in my head, and I think that as I was listening to the listener, what for me the trigger or the motivation can be what you have done. Now, my point of view or my understanding is, Die bestel waarin ons geleef het. Die pol, kom ek sê dit man. Die politieke bestel. Die apartheidse regering waarin onder, vooral jy, wat bekie ouwer is, as lyk vir my as Shannon, wat ons onder geleef het. Ek is 1952 gebore, so ek het een goeie dosis van apartheid gehad, wat in 1948 begin het. Het bepalend op ons eie levens ingespeel, wat ons vandag is, wat van ons geword het, ons kinders was, en ons studeer, of nie kon studeer nie, die stelsel in ons land het groot dinge bepaal vir ons, wie ons is. En ek nou vraag specifiek, het die aparte politieke bestel waarin ons, jylle ook, jylle twee geleef het, jylle beinvloed om te skryf, om te ervaar dit wat jylle ervaar het? Ons hoor so baie om te, vir ons word gesê, moet nie nou wie apartheid inbring nie man. Maar ons kan nooit apartheid nie inbring nie. What I did was, with this book, because it was my younger self, 
I had not experienced, um, and I grew up in Lansdowne, Claremont area, which was a bit more sheltered than what it was um, further out. So after removals, I went to Mitchell's Plain. And so that is where I became um, um, more aware. Uh, now, I did my protests and whatnot, and I went to UWC, I went to Tiek, <laughs> <laughs> you know that whole thing of Hecto. Um, yeah, and then I was also at Pentec, um and a few other places. So I used my journalism. I used it as um, witnessing. For me, it was very important. But in this book, I'm not. Uh, I had to rein in what I knew of what was happening in. Um, society in general. I had to speak from that child's perspective. And so that is why I have a more general view of people um, actually trying to achieve, trying to be better, um, longing for, um, how shall I say, um, having the sense of longing to, to improve, um, but then also being affected by where they found themselves. You know, the the, the pin dumped on the cave flats. Um, like showing a story, uh, it's actually, it comes after. It's after the dumping on the on the cave flats. Mm -hmm. So it is like um, almost a progression of, 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 she is, her, her society, her generation is a product of the dumping. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. Okay. Shannon, I think we have... I just wanted to add on to Bronwyn's point. Um, it does, I do slightly speak of how I'm not from the apartheid era, but my parents were and all of my older siblings. And I very much feel like my generation was a product of um, the repercussions of freedom. Mm -hmm. So I had to deal with everybody who didn't want the apartheid to be over and their children mm -hmm. and now being forced. And it very much did affect how I saw myself, particularly going to a white, white slash Model C school mm. as a first generation to wow. do that in my family. Wow. And it messed me up very much. So yes, it does. It very much did affect my story. Thank you, Yelle. Right. One question. Sorry, um, this question is towards China. As a high school student, you don't see a lot of literature written in the style that you write it. It sounds as if after reading Ochat, you, after you read it and while you're reading it, it sounds as if you're talking to a family member and they're giving you advice and encouraging you and also motivating to talk about your trauma and experiences. As a colored girl, you don't see a lot of books like that, that gives a perspective from a colored girl and talks in the voice of a colored girl as well, that makes you feel accepted in your language as well. Because a lot of the times you hear people who, talk mingled or talk English is an informal language or it becomes as a negative stereotype. So what motivated you to write in that sort of style as a colored girl? Exactly that. I very much um, believe, so So I, I have a lot of thoughts about Afrikaans, mingles, all of those things. I feel that there are a lot of dialects within the Afrikaans because every colored person I know has a different way that they speak. And when I, like the gentleman just brought up. Now, when I went to a white school, they made fun of me so much for the way I sounded. I didn't even know I sound funny because I come from I came from a Mitchell's friend school. I went there. Then I got to the to the to the white school. You know, your parents tell you, bless them. They they just did the best they could for me. But they say, check on You know, like Then I tried to ra ra. It sounded ridiculous on me. And then when I went home. The children made fun of me, you know? And so no matter where I went, because I wasn't being my authentic self, I was the guy. And I encountered it also. I encountered it also at work. Because you you raise this proud colored girl, you now get the opportunities nobody else got, and you wanna fit in, and you also wanna you wanna make a dent, but you also don't wanna stand out too much because you want them to the end. It's a very confusing thing. And I got to the office and People made fun of, they, they'd have the meetings, and it sounds cliche, but I swear to God this happened. You sit in your meeting, you're just as educated and there, 
as everybody else. And they greet everyone and they say, oh, where's Saina? <laughs> and it's just like, no, but uncle, you're white. And you, can't, <laughs> you can't just say that to me, you know? And then, you, then you're stuck between, do I defend myself? Do I not? And then I got to the point where I decided my, my sound is not going to be unprofessional anymore. There are so many people of color, in my opinion, doing so many amazing things at our own capacity, in our own ways. We belong exactly as we are where we are. So my friends now and me make the point of just being blood. And they must, they must, they mustn't. Because before even I made the mistake, I heard my accent as a bitchy of, then I think, mm, girl, you don't talk like that on the news. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but I realized that's conditioning. So now our accent, I must my hear it everywhere and it will we'll normalize it. It's fine. Kort vragie, hoe kom het jou boek die Afrikaanse naam gegee ou gat? So I don't think, I, I know it's Afrikaans, but I also grew up with like a mixed sort of, you know? And so I use Afrikaans, English interchangeably, and I specifically chose Ogat because it's a, it's a word I think everybody that I know doesn't know as the Ogat, as in cute or however it's thing is. It was Ogat as in don't keep your Ogat, you know? <laughs> and that's why I selected that. <laughs> On the high note, thank you very much for coming and it's been a privilege.